On the virtual Bible study tonight, we want to continue our discussion on Bible authority. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, Jacob. We've had real interest. Uh, uh, we, we've had some very lively discussion via the chat room. Uh, last week, we had so much discussion in the chat room that we couldn't get to. We want to try to cover some of that more All right, tonight. And it's going to be a good discussion, an important discussion. We need to understand God's Word and will for us. And and the word that we've been sort of batting back and forth is interpret. How do we interpret the Bible? How do we know what God wants us to do? We're going to get to that on this uh, edition of the Virtual Bible Study, and we're starting right now. It's time for this week's edition of the Virtual Bible Study. The Virtual Bible Study is a live, internet-only call-in program dedicated to the honest study and discussion of God's Word. Do you have a question about something in the Bible? Or are you simply interested in learning more about the Scriptures? If so, we hope you'll stay tuned tonight as we look into the pages of God's Word. The Virtual Bible Study is brought to you this time each week by the College View Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. You can participate in the discussion tonight by calling 93 Three one three eight one four five six seven, or by emailing your questions or comments from collegeview.com. We hope you'll take out your Bibles and study along with us as we begin an exciting study of God's Word on this edition of the Virtual Bible Study. And this is the Virtual Bible Study for Thursday, December 21st, 2017. One more to go in 2017 after this. Uh, we're glad that you're part of the program tonight and look forward to hearing from you. My name is Jacob Gwynn. My father Greg Gwynn is here. Hello, Dad. Jacob, great to be with you tonight. From you on the other Got end, Kyle of the, behind the board. Kyle, yeah, Kyle's back behind the boards. Welcome back, Kyle. That's good to be. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you here, and glad that you're listening on the other end of the line tonight. And we'll look forward to you signing in the chat room and commenting with other listeners. Eight seven seven three eight one four five six seven. Questions at collegeview.com or other ways you can participate in the program tonight. And uh, this program is uh, well, it's sponsored tonight by the the chat room last week. Uh, the, the, uh, there was so much commenting there in the chat room that we couldn't get to it all, and we wanted to uh, get to, to some more of that this week and continue the discussion, answer some of the things that we left loose uh, last week. And so I think uh, that's what we're going to try to do, and we want more comments. We love, you love your participation. Before we get to that, Jacob, let us push our uh, uh, Bible reading calendars for 2018. We've got yep. those printed, ready to roll. Uh, if you'd like a hard copy of that, if you'll send us your snail mail address, uh, send us an email with your U.S. postage address in it. We'll stick one in the mail to you. We'll throw a we'll throw a bumper sticker in with it, and uh, you can help us get the word out while you're also in, enjoying a daily Bible reading calendar. We've talked about this calendar for many years now. It's a five day a week reading schedule. Instead of seven days, you're assigned to read five days, and that gives you a chance to catch up if you miss a day, something happens, and you get behind. And it's it's historically chronological through the Scriptures, and we just really think it's a good Bible reading schedule, and uh, we'd be glad to get you So on. you're not starting in Genesis and going through to Revelation. You're you're moving around a well, little bit. Well, you do start in Genesis. You do, but you don't go yeah, straight through yeah. to Revelation. But there's an Old Testament assignment each day, and an and a New Testament assignment each day, and usually a reading in the Psalms as well. Uh, but it takes, it depends on the speed, how fast you read, but I think you can typically do it in 15 to 20 minutes a day. Yeah, you're faster than most. Yeah, maybe less than a half hour. But, you know, you also have the option of just reading the Old Testament uh, through or just reading the New Testament through, but I think it's really beneficial. And it's a five-day program, so if you've got a busy day during the week and, you, and something happens, you can catch up on you the You don't weekend. want to get too far behind, though. You want to try to you keep up. You do want to keep up. All right. Because you can get discouraged. Questions at collegeview.com is the way you get those uh, calendars and those bumper stickers, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so let us know. Now, um, but, before we start into our actual discussion for the program tonight, Jake, I wanted to comment on a couple of emails that came in from people who uh, were participating last week. Uh, uh, one one uh, correspondent said that he believed that we were closed-minded to anyone who have a different interpretation. We believe anybody who doesn't agree with us is wrong, and that we're closed-minded to actually listening to different beliefs. And then another person said uh, that we were harshly judging uh, and condemning people. Um, and I wanted to address that. It is not our intention to harshly judge people. Um, and, we, yeah. and, and I really hope that we're not closed-minded. But having said that, I want to tell you, we believe what we believe strongly. That's, we understand we, we can be wrong. And if we are, we're open to correction. 
But we're not on the virtual Bible study to express our doubts and misgivings. Uh, we're not here to just say, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure you can, if there's no answer. We're just out here wandering around uh, aimlessly. We, have, we, we can't be sure what God wants. We believe we can be sure. Uh, again, so it's it's a two-edged sword. Yeah, we, we believe we, we can be wrong. We also believe we, sh we should have confidence in what we do believe. Yeah, we believe, we understand. We've ch changed. Uh, I think everybody acknowledges that they've come to a fuller understanding of God's truth over time and that you change when you f find something that you had not previously understood correctly. But having said that, I think, I, I, I mean, I am not, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, shy away from saying that I, what I believe, I believe strongly. Uh, I, I don't want to be mean-spirited about it. I don't want to be harsh. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to state what we understand the scriptures to teach with We're not here to just sort of uh, act like we don't know anything and, and just be blown with every wind of doctrine. We... we we have studied the scriptures, and, and, and we're willing to stand on what we understand them to teach uh, with the caveat that certainly all, all men are fallible. We are, we are, we're fallible men. We can be wrong if we are show us so. But, but we make no apology for speaking the truth boldly and in love. That's what Paul said we are supposed to do. Okay. And I, and I wanted to comment on, on uh, what has been perceived as our tone, perhaps. Mike in Nashville said to judge one so, someone so harshly as to condemn them because of their honest attempts to rightly divide, you're at risk of being judged as harshly because of your accidental mistakes. And, and then uh, John, in his uh, email, he said that he had been offended uh, by some of the responses that uh, we had made to his comments in the chat room, as well as uh, he said the floodgates opened and ridicule poured out on him, uh, perhaps what we were saying and what was in the chat room. We did not intend our no, tone to be taken that way, no. and so uh, we apologize that and we were mistaken. That's not our tone. We're, we're passionate about what we believe, yeah. uh, but we don't. We don't. It's not a personal attack. We no. don't take it personally. We no. don't hand it out personally. It's just we're just trying to, we're passionate about trying to understand and teach the Scripture. And we're, we're somewhat isolated here. We, we, we're not sitting across the table for, for us or, or in person, so it's sometimes our tone and our, uh, our attitude can be mistaken. We want to make sure that our listeners understand yeah. we're not, we don't want to be harsh. We don't want to be ridiculing. Uh, and so that, that's... But, but having said that, yep. we're not shying away from what we believe, and we accept the accountability of that. In James chapter 3, verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, or other versions say the harsher judgment. We understand by virtue of the fact that we put ourselves in this position and we teach that we're accountable for what we teach, and we accept that accountability, uh, and, and we're, and, and we're, and we're non-apologetic for teaching what we believe. If we're wrong, show us, but, and, we don't want, and we certainly don't intend to be harsh or mean-spirited at all, yep. but we're going to teach what we teach passionately. Yeah, and, uh, and we don't want to ridicule anyone, or, and so if, if you take it that way, uh, let us know if, we, if we, you think we've crossed the line. We certainly yep. want to keep this on a, uh, a positive note, and we want to uh, all come to a better understanding of the Scriptures, and as you said, we could be wrong, and that's why... We ask for those who disagree with us to call in. It's not so that we can ridicule them or uh, or uh, deride them. It's so that we can see another uh, viewpoint and uh, compare it with what the Scriptures teach uh, so that we all can come to a better understanding of God's Word. All right, 877-381-4567, questions at collegeview.com. Randy in uh, Swartz Creek, Michigan tonight said, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So I think Randy agrees with your comment that we can be confident in the, the fact that we can understand God's will for us. Okay, good. Thanks, Randy. Um, to our update list earlier today, we sent out some comments out of the chat room that we wanted to let you know what we're going to be talking about tonight. If you're not on our update list, you can be. Send us an email at questions at collegeview.com. Say, add me to the list. To our update list earlier today, we ask, how would you respond to these comments made last week in the chat room? All three of the basic methods of interpretation you use, command, example, inference, require the judgment of man at some level especially necessary inference. What scriptures give man the 
the authority to use human wisdom when interpreting God's word. Okay. And this was a lot of what we talked about last week, and we've got some more to say about it. In other words, are, is there a method of understanding? Uh, that's, we'll get to that in a minute. Number two, comment on this statement by another participant in the chat room. Quote, for consistent reasoning, expedience should be used to justify a building, not necessary inference. All we necessarily infer is a place to assemble, not to buy and sell real estate. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on the application of expediency and necessary, mm -hmm. necessary inference. And we want to talk about that. Number three, another chat room comment was, I love hearing Acts 15 used. So what do you see? I asked the question, what do you see in Acts 15 that applies to the discussion? And of I think that already? comment was made in, sort of in gesture and derision there that, uh, that, that we shouldn't use Acts chapter 15. Uh, he, he goes on and says it was such a stretch to use Acts 15. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. I, thought he, yep. I thought that was nope. I so, thought he was a, nope. in agreement. That, nope, that, okay. it was not. Okay, well, we're, we're going to look at Acts 15 a little bit and, and see how it's used. Yep. Number four, how would you reply to this comment in the chat room? Quote, greet one another with a holy kiss as a direct command. Some man at some time decided this is not to be bound. And so specifically, uh, does this show an inconsistency? Are we being inconsistent about the holy kiss? And finally, is Jesus' example of washing the disciples' feet a binding example? Or is this perhaps another case of us picking and choosing which examples we bind and don't bind? All right. So lots to talk about tonight and hopefully lots of your comments as well. If you're not signed into the chat room tonight, sign in and uh, share your comments. And uh, let's keep this all in a positive light here and uh, in a positive tone. But let's, uh, let's reason together and, uh, and talk about what God's uh, will for us is and how we can determine that in our lives today. 877-381-4567 is how you can get on the line with us tonight and talk to us in person. That's toll free. The line is open. We'd love to hear from you tonight as we talk about interpreting God's will, will for us and uh, biblical interpretation. Okay, so the first question is, what about this statement? It was made in the chat room last week. All three of the basic methods of interpretation that you use, talking about us, command, example, and inference, require the judgment of man at some level, especially necessary inference. What, get, what scriptures give man the authority to use human wisdom when interpreting God's word? Okay. I want to just let some of our email responses sort of lead us in that discussion. Brendan, I think Brendan's out west somewhere, Jacob. I believe he's in Oregon. Maybe Oregon. Yep. I haven't heard from Brendan in a while. Thanks for writing in, Brendan. Well, he was in Oregon or headed back to Oregon. He was getting ready to catch a flight, so he had to make this response short. Yes, but he says, commands, examples, and necessary inference are just another way of saying, tell, show, imply. I can tell you to take out the trash, command. I can show you by doing it as an example, or I can say to you, it really smells in here. I wish that smell would be taken outside where it belongs. That's an inference or implication from which you might infer. It's how we communicate every day. I, I really like that. Uh, Brendan is saying, if I want to get a message across to you, I, do, I either tell you directly, I set an example hoping that you would imitate the example, or I imply something and hope you draw the inference from it. He says, for those who say that command, example, and inference is not a valid way of interpretation, or it's just a man-made way of doing things, please explain to me why, without telling me, showing me, or implying something, uh, how are you going to communicate to me? You can't, you can't do it. Uh, God has made himself known in these ways because it's how we communicate, and he made us to communicate. Yep. Great, great response there, Brendan. I think Brendan is right that. on with that. Okay. Uh, I had a holdover on Kent, uh, from Kent and Georgia from last week's uh, program that we didn't get to, he said, those of the liberal persuasion reject these concepts of command, example, and inference. They attempt to argue that these are only inventions of human wisdom. They are wrong. Such is not a human methodology. Such is a logical and rational process that must be employed in all forms of human communication. One cannot read a novel, newspaper, or email without using this process to ascertain the meaning of the of the original intent of the one who wrote the communication. The case being that God has communicated his word to us in human language necessitates that this logical, rational process of thinking be applied to the study of the Bible. Therefore, the concepts of statements, approved examples, implications, and necessary inference are all essential elements for us to know what God desires us uh, to know and do. I th I, and, and so his, his statement is very similar to what Brendan said. 
It's how we communicate. When I pick up the Bible and, and I see words on the page, are they just words or do they mean something? If they mean something, I have to use some process to, to read the words and then comprehend the meaning of it. It's, it's communication. I like the fact that both of those guys said it's, it's how we communicate. Uh, and, and we do it on all levels. And that's just how God communicates. And again, we are not married to the terms direct command, approved example, necessary inference. If you want to call it something else, I think Brendan said, uh, tell, show, imply. Uh, how, however you want to say it, we're just, we're just trying to get a handle on that, that process of understanding communication. All right, quickly, you got another email from Kent earlier today where he said the statement made by this individual that, uh, about human wisdom he says, it confuses human wisdom with human reason. One cannot properly study the Bible without the usage of human reason. If human reason needs to be excluded, one could never know that any direct statement is to be bound on any individual. Furthermore, the concept of implication and inference must certainly be used to make the, uh, distinctions in biblical covenants. We use such by correctly concluding that animal sacrifices and the building of an ark is not authorized activity for the gospel age. God has uh, always provided verbal, plenary, insp inspired information for humanity by one, directly telling us what he wants, two, showing us what he wants, and three, implying that he wants from which he what, he, wa what he wants from necessary uh, from which we necessarily infer inescapable conclusions. This is not simply a religious method. This is an inescapable, logical, rational that one must use in all areas of life, even when we read novels, send email, or read the newspaper. Certainly, we need to avoid human wisdom. However, human reason is a God-given faculty that must be properly used to draw correct conclusions from the Bible. I, I think Kent is exactly right, and, we, and, and th this reaffirms some of the things that we were saying last week. Uh, and we don't want to get tied up in semantics, but human wisdom, that's, that's me supplanting my think-so over what I read in the Bible. I think Kent's right to use the, a, a term like human reasoning. Last week we talked about using our intellect or our powers of logic and deduction. It's not that we're saying, I'm wise and I'm going to put my wisdom in place of what I read in the Bible, or I'm, my wisdom is going to, to, to somehow shade the meaning of the Bible. Uh, so I think the I think the terminology human wisdom is the wrong terminology. We're not using human wisdom. We're using human reason or human intellect or uh, human mental capacity to read and understand. And so I think that's I think that's right. All right, Mo in the chat room says all obedience to God will require us to make a judgment based on Scripture as to what God has revealed and how to do it. When you get a break, and when we get back, we'll get your comments. If you're not in the chat room yet, sign in and let's hear them there, or give us a call eight seven seven three eight one four five six seven. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. Don't touch that mouse. The virtual Bible study will be back right after this. Hi, I'm Wade Shelton. In 1 Peter 3.15, the scripture says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You see, we believe here at College View that we should be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks it. And I believe that we are dedicated to this cause. That's why we here at College View bring you the virtual Bible study each week. Our hope is that you will join us each week here on the Virtual Bible Study in hopes of strengthening your faith so that you will be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Please join us here every Thursday night on the Virtual Bible Study. I know that it's worth an hour of your time. Here's some quotes worth pondering. In trying times, don't quit trying. Every crisis in life makes us bitter or better. It's our choice. He who angers you controls you. Example is a language that anyone can read. Man, wish I'd said that. A streaming Bible study. Why didn't I think of that? Now back to the guys. And we're back on the program tonight as we talk about uh, authority and biblical interpretation, continuing a discussion we've had for several weeks now, and it's been a good one, and we want to continue that discussion tonight. Doug uh, sent an email. Doug's in the chat room tonight. Doug, thank you for your reply. He says, first, I would make the correction that however you wish to refer to them, the three tenets of command, example, and inference 
are not methods of interpretation because they describe the writer, that's God, uh, his manner of communication rather than the reader, that's man, uh, process of comprehension. Therefore, command example inference does not require man's judgment at any level. While this may seem nitpicky, it is important to understand that to command example inference is not our responsibility and is, in fact, just a sample of the many techniques that Bible authors use to deliver their message. On the flip side, human wisdom must be used any time a human reads the Bible. What scripture we have preserved for us was written by God through men and for men, so it is necessary, necessarily compatible with man's intelligence. To suppose otherwise is to assume that God failed as a communicator. I think that's, I like that last part especially. Uh, God communicated uh, in a way that's compatible with our intelligence, or else he, fa- he fails as a communicator. I, uh, now, Doug used the idea of human wisdom has to be used when a human reads the Bible, and, I, and we just talked about that. I, th- I think I would use the word intellect or reasoning capabilities, but, but I, I, I think uh, Doug's on the same page with us there on that. All right, and so this idea of human wisdom, it is a, a sticking point for some, uh, and one listener... Uh, uh, you're very adamant, and rightly so, in demanding scriptural authority for everything you do. So I will ask my question again. Where can I go in God's Word to have authority to inject my own wisdom, intellect, or logic? This is a very important question for me. Scripture, to, to, to say that we have authority to interject. And, we, and the, the idea of wisdom here is, uh, we want to make, we, we've, we've talked on that, but what about the idea of our intellect or our logic? Well, I was thinking about that. Uh, and I was thinking of the example of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. In Acts 17, verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scripture. In Acts 18, verse 4, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 18, verse 19, Paul came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Acts 24, verse 25, as Paul, uh, Paul had been before Felix, and it says, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Uh, well, there's the example of the apostle Paul. Well, exactly what was he doing? He was reasoning. And so the question, uh, read that question. I've got that highlighted somewhere. Yeah, it says, uh, so I will ask my question again. Where can I go in God's Word to have authority to inject my own wisdom, intellect, or logic? This is a very important question for me. Well, again, uh, it's not our own wisdom, but it is our intellect or logic or reasoning capability. And and there's some examples from the the Apostle Paul using reasoning to, to persuade about what God wants us to do. Okay, I think I, again I I, I I disagree with the use of the terminology human wisdom. We've talked about that already, but in regards to using our intellect or our logic or our reasoning capacities, there's there's the inspired apostle Paul doing that very thing. Another passage came to mind: First Peter chapter one verse ten, talking about the prophets of the of old and the salvation that they were prophesying about that they didn't understand, but it says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So these prophets, God prophesied things to them, but then they had to use their logic to try and interpret what the prophecy meant and when, what time that, and how that, how it was all going to unfold. Uh, we see the prophets of old doing that, again, not applying their own wisdom, uh, not saying, okay, you know, I think it'd be best here if I if I lied in these circumstances. I think it'd be best if I uh, committed adultery in these circumstances. It, It seems right to me. No, they weren't doing that, but they were interpreting God's word and uh, applying um, their logic to uh, understand what God had said. Right, exactly right. All right. We got a comment from guest 6297 in the chat room. One inconsistency I see is with church buildings. Uh, It's inferred that it's expedient to own a building, but the Bible gives examples where church can meet, homes, public spaces, or buildings of other religious organizations. Why is this not buying? Hang on to that. We're going to talk about the church building in just a minute. So we're not going to, we're not skipping your comment, but just hang on to that for a minute. Uh, 
the, uh, then he says, he goes on to say, the word sing is wholly binding, but with a building we get to decide what to add. Hang on to that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then Randy in Swartz Creek, Michigan said, the Apostle Paul said, we rightly divide the word, Second Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, or handling to write the word of truth. Uh, again, that reference, that inf implies some... Right, uh, logic to rightly and, divide and reasoning. You're, 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 you're exactly right, Randy. That's a Thank good you, comment. Randy. All right, let's go quickly to our second question. There was a comment made, for consistent reasoning, expedience should be used to justify a building, not necessary inference. All we necessarily infer is a place to assemble, not to buy and sell real estate. Uh, w with all kindness to the person who wrote that, 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 ex that exposes a misunderstanding about expediencies uh, in relationship to Bible authority. Okay. In regard, expedience is is areas of judgment where we make decisions, make judgment calls. Those are only allowed in areas that are already authorized. In other words, I, I can only use an expedient in regards to something that is is means it's authorized either by command example or necessary inference if it's if it's authorized if it and it's and it's general if it's authorized and it's a general authority then we use expedience for instance uh, I, I believe uh, that we are to take a collection on the first day of the week first Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2 yep. so there's the authority 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, authorizes us to take up a collection. Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to, we're going to have everybody march up front and, and drop their money in a, in a box up front. Uh, we're going to pass a tray around uh, where people are seated. The, the tray that we – typically that's how we do it, we pass a tray. That, that, that tray is an expedient. Right. But it's, but it's allowed because we have the authority to take up the collection. Right. And so in regards to the church building, the church building is authorized by necessary inference. Act, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There's your command. Don't forsake the assembling. So we're commanded to assemble. The command to assemble implies that there must be some place to assemble. Okay. We infer in other words, the implication is there, and we infer, therefore, that we have authority to provide for such a meeting place. It's not, exclu it's not that we, we infer buy and sell real estate. It, it is that there must be a meeting place. And so you can come by a meeting place lots of different ways. You could, you could rent one. You could borrow one. You could meet in private homes. You can meet in public facilities. We see some of that. We see private homes. We see people meeting in public. Uh, we see Christians meeting in public facilities. There's not an exclusive pattern there, and and one of the choices is to own a piece of property to accommodate the assembly. Okay. Uh, and so we have we have we have authority to assemble, which implies a place to assemble, and one of the expedients that we can choose is to own. A church building, but that's not the only. We could choose. Or we we, or we could say we're just going to meet out here underneath a big shade tree. Okay, that's really nice on certain spring and autumn days. But in the hot heat of summer or in the cold cold of winter, that's not a very good judgment. It's, it's a judgment. It's a, it's it's a it's an allowed judgment, but it wouldn't be very edifying. And Paul said that expedience should edify. Okay, so but back to the question that was posed in the chat room. The Bible gives examples of where a church can meet. Homes, public spaces, or um, the buildings of other religious organizations. I guess the synagogues and, and so forth. Yeah, why, yeah. why is this not binding, the, question, the, the listener asks. The reason it's not binding is because there's not any, anything exclusive there. In other words, the fact that we see it being done in different ways shows that there's not a, a specified pattern that we must follow. If, it was, if, if we only always saw Christians meeting in private homes, then we could begin to argue maybe we should be meeting in private homes rather than in a public facility. But the fact that we see it, Paul met uh, in Ephesus the school of Tyrannus, a public place. The early Christians met on the temple grounds in Jerusalem. 
we certainly know that they met in private homes. Uh, the church met in the home of Aquila and Priscilla. So the, the reason why it's not binding is because there's no exclusive pattern. Okay. All right. Guess 6297 says this is inconsistent. All right. Well, um, uh, let's, uh, let's keep that discussion coming in the chat room. Keep your, your thoughts coming there. Uh, D- Doug in the uh, chat room says, I think we should be cautious when we assume authority for the church corporate to own property. Well, that's, uh, that, but it's, uh, we're not assuming. Be careful. Be careful about to use the word assume. Assume says we don't have any basis for it. We, we have the basis for it by necessary inference. The command to assemble infer uh, implies, and we infer from that, that we must have some place to meet. We can we can provide for it in many different ways. No way is specified. Therefore, we're not assuming. We're 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 following logically following the process of Bible authority. We're not assuming. We're saying the the inference that we must have. A place for the commanded assembling says that we're we're therefore at our liberty to use what we deem is the best judgment expedient. Okay. And 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 uh, I I I have been a part of meetings in public facilities and private homes, in rented facilities. So in own facility, but there's no exclusive pattern in the scripture. Therefore, no one of those things is bound upon us. Okay. All right. We see them meeting in different places. Uh, 6297 says, by your logic, adding instruments to singing is a okay. Absolutely not. Absolutely. That, that's absolute oranges. Absolutely not. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's continue. 877-381-4567, questions at collegeview.com. Mimo says there's also an example of meeting at a riverside. This shows a variety of places, not a specific uh, limited places. So the command is to assemble, and they assembled. And we can see that there was not an exclusive requirement on where they assembled. They, there was, there was their, uh, the liberty to assemble where they desired and where it was convenient. Yeah. And so we can follow the same liberty today. Exactly. Let's, let's, let's catch our emails real quick. And we're, man, we're going, to, we're going to go over again, Jacob. Uh, Kent says, where there is no authority, there can be no expedience. Colossians 3.17. The New Testament does not specify the meeting place of a local church. However, by implication inference, we ascertain, according to Hebrews 10.25, the necessity of a place for the local church to assemble. Therefore, because we have authority for a place to assemble and truth has not legislated the specific type of meeting place, expedience justifies any lawful means to obey the command to assemble. Purchasing, selling, renting, or borrowing all fit the requirements of generic authority as per the command in Hebrews 10.25. Thus, what is most expedient in these cases for a local church would be acceptable. I think that's my same explanation. Thank you, Kent. All right. Thank you, Kent. All right. Um, and then uh, Doug, in the chat, uh, in it, who's in the chat room, says, implication is the writer's part, inference the reader's, necessary inference, inescapable conclusion, logical certainty, whatever you call it, each requires that there is one and only one conclusion to a given question. A church building is a convenience, neither, necess- neither necessary or, nor spiritually profitable, expedient by Christ and Paul. So neither can be used as validation of God's approval for its use. When looking to justify the use of a church building, one must look to God's silence on the matter, the fact that he did not specify a meeting location coupled with our certainty that a building does not violate any instruction given. There are, however, other considerations which might independently reject a church building from our list of acceptable meeting places. Uh, for example, can the church own? Can the collection be used as funding, etc.? All right. I'm not, not sure of all of what Doug maybe have been suggesting there in his comment, but uh, the church building is... Owning a church building is a, an expedient, uh, but it's based upon authority. And I, I, I see that in his comment, but I'm, I'm not sure I would say it all exactly the same way he said it. Okay, I guess 6297 says, I'm not trying to be difficult. This is just troubling. You know, and, uh, and certainly uh, 6297, let's uh, continue the discussion on the other side of the break. We want to get, uh, get to the bottom of this and uh, see if we can come uh, to a clearer understanding. Uh, we'll get a break, get this week's bullet point. Appreciate all the comments in the chat room. Keep them coming, and uh, we'll get more on the other side. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after this. These guys are doing all of the talking. We need to hear from you. Call in now. The virtual Bible study continues right after this. This is Greg Gwynn with this week's bullet point. 
It's not uncommon to hear members of various denominations refer to the physical building where their group meets as the church. They might say, I was at the church yesterday and I saw John. Or, we're so proud of our church, it's been standing there for over a hundred years. It's clear that they do not understand the New Testament usage of the word church. In our Bibles, the word church is translated from the Greek word ekklesia, which literally means called out. If you are a Christian, God called you unto his kingdom and glory, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, called you into the grace of Christ, Galatians 1, verse 6, called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. This call was not a mysterious, better felt than told sort of thing. It was accomplished through God's simple truth revealed in the New Testament. Quote, he called you by our gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. And so the church, the called out, is a term that applies to people, not to structures of wood, brick, and stone. To stress this simple fact, some brethren have taken the extra precaution of altering the signs on their buildings to read, Church of Christ meets here. The building is not the church, you see, but the church meets here. That seems clear enough. One group we know of went to the extreme measure of adding this explanation on their street sign. Christians comprising a New Testament Church of Christ meet at this place. Okay, we get it. While such specificity on signs may not be entirely necessary, it is important to remember that the building is not the church, the church is the people. And while buildings come and go, we have the confidence that the Lord's church is, quote, a kingdom which cannot be moved, Hebrews 12, verse 28. It is an everlasting kingdom, 2 Peter 1, verse 11, of which there shall be no end, Luke 1, verse 33. We're thankful to God for the church. That's this week's bullet point. Think about it. Hi, my name is Jack. I am eight years old, and this is Vulture Bible Study. We're waiting to hear from you. Call in right now and join in on the virtual Bible study. Now, back to the program. We're back on the program tonight, and we're glad that you're listening. I want to remind you this program is brought to you by the College U Church of Christ in Columbia, Tennessee. Find out more about us by visiting our website, thevirtualbiblestudy.com. Come and worship with us if you're in the Columbia, Tennessee area. And uh, we'd love to worship and study the Bible with you. Uh, find out more again at thevirtualbiblestudy.com. Send us an email to questions at collegeu.com with your questions, your comments, your suggestions for future editions of the Virtual Bible Study, and to request your free Bible reading calendar and or your free bumper sticker to help get the word out about the program. The program certainly is better when there are more listeners and more listeners interacting, and uh, you can help accomplish that by uh, helping us get the word out. So get one of those bumper stickers and firmly affix it to your bumper or your rear window to help spread the word. We're talking about uh, authority and biblical interpretation on the program again tonight. Doug is in the chat room, and he, he goes a little further to explain. My point about ownership, he says, is that it doesn't seem to fit the nature of biblical um, my screen is jumping. Yeah, on it's the, jumped does, around here. Uh, doesn't seem to fit the nature of biblical local assemblies to act as corporate entities which can hold a deed. There is no example or necessary implication that it may do so. In fact, all the examples we have exclude church ownership. Thus, my comment is that we have to be careful to assume authority for the church donor. Uh, we we just differ on that, Doug. Uh, my explanation is that there's no exclusive pattern in regards to the type of meeting place uh, in other words that's been left in the realm of expedience you couldn't say we're commanded to rent we're commanded to borrow we're commanded you can't say we are exclusively authorized to meet in private homes there's no exclusive pattern therefore one of the options it may not be the best option in every case but one of the options is to own own and maintain property for the purposes uh, but but again, uh, the, we could make we could make the same. The, now, I, I would grant there's no example of churches owning buildings in the New Testament, but but we're not basing our action on a, an exclusive pattern or an example. We're saying because it's not exclusive. there's no exclusive pattern. Therefore, we are at liberty. It's a generally authorized thing, and we are at liberty to use our discretion or judgment or expedient to get to the conclusion. Same is true with travel. The, the Apostle Paul traveled on his missionary journeys in a various uh, different ways. Uh, are we limited to traveling in just the ways that Paul traveled, or are we at liberty to travel by modern car or airplane? Mm -hmm. We but say we are at liberty to travel in because, different ways because, because it wasn't go exclusive. Because is a general command. General command, and, and we see f liberty in how they applied that command. Now, we know that in the first century, the command to go was accommodated by walking, taking a ship, riding a beast. Yeah. But 
I don't think anybody says, well, therefore we're limited to the, uh, one of those options. Right. Uh, we understand go is a general command, and when there's a general command, we're at liberty to use expedient means. Expedients have to be lawful. They have to be edifying. But we're, we're at liberty to use expedient means to accommodate the, 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 the fulfillment of God's will. All right, let's move on. And okay. uh, if you'd like to have further discussion about that, send us an email to questions at collegeview.com. Uh, there's more to get to, though, here, and we're going to run out of time if we're not careful. We used, uh, okay, the next question we talked about was Acts 15, and I didn't understand. So you think the person in the chat room yeah, it was, was James in the chat room. James said that he thought it was a stretch to use Acts 15 to show that these types of interpretations were being used. I, I really don't think it is a stretch. Uh, Monty was with us on the program last week, and Monty pointed out, and others have in the past, that in Acts 15, remember Acts 15 is when, the early church, there was a, a meeting in Jerusalem because false teachers had been going out of Jerusalem teaching that Gentile converts had to be circumcised. Gentile converts had to keep some aspects of the law of Moses. We sometimes refer to those as Judaizing teachers. They were going out from Jerusalem teaching that doctrine. It was not true. Paul knew it wasn't true. Paul knew it wasn't true before he even went to Jerusalem. But he went up there, basically, I would say, in my own terminology, he went up there to put a stop to it. He was going he, he to nip that in the bud. He wanted, to, he wanted to silence those false teachers. So he went up there, and he met with the apostles, and there was a big meeting and discussion of the matter. But the, the mat, they didn't decide it. They didn't take a vote. It wasn't a decision-making conference. But in the course of discussing this, Notice in uh, in verse 7, Acts 15, 7, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and, be, and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And so Paul said, or excuse me, this was Peter. Peter said, here's an example. The fact that, that God bestowed the miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles, Cornelius' household specifically, is a demonstration by example that God wanted the gospel to go to the Gentiles. Then Paul and Barnabas in verse 12, the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. God was empowering Paul and Barnabas to do miracles as they were preaching to Gentiles. And Paul is saying, the fact that he is empowering us to do miracles in the process of teaching these Gentiles clearly implies, and from it we infer, that God wants the gospel to go to the Gentiles. So Peter used the example of what happened at the house of Cornelius. Paul and Barnabas used necessary inference. If, why would God be empowering us to work miracles if he doesn't want the gospel to go to the Gentiles? Okay. And then finally, James says in, in verse 13 beginning, after they had held their peace, James answered and saying, Men and brethren, hearken to me. Simon had declared how God had the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his own name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. James quotes Old Testament prophecy. In other words, this was a direct statement by God that the gospel was ultimately going to go that, to, the, to the Gentiles. And so James uses a, a direct statement from God that this was his will. In Acts 15, it is no stretch. In Acts 15, we have example necessary inference, and direct command. Ken agrees, yes, all areas of our life must be governed by Bible authority. Acts 15 demonstrates the need for a respecting Bible authority as it relates to biblical fellowship. Statements, examples, and implication and inferences need to be properly applied in all areas as it relates to biblical fellowship. And going back again to what we were said earlier, that's just the way we communicate. That's how humans communicate. Call it what you want. We're not... As I said earlier, we're not wedded to the terms command, example, and inference. Call it what you want, but that's the process of communication. And get, that gets back to, to the questioner who said, give us an example of where human reasoning or logic had to be used. Well, they did that in Acts chapter 15. Clearly, exactly. Exactly. they're using human reasoning and logic to 
interpret what God's instruction and will was. Now, uh, Doug has also responded to the question and says, Acts 15 is a wonderful account of the body of Christ coming together in unity to sort out a problem. While the elements of command, example, and inference can be observed in this passage again, they're only part of a bigger picture. It's easy to say that Peter made a solid deduction. Paul and Barnabas pointed to the example of their works, and James recalled a prophecy that part of God's people would come from the Gentiles. But what line of reasoning led James to judge that the Gentiles should refrain from eating, which was sacrificed to idols, or that which was sacrificed to idols, along with the other instructions of Acts 15, 19 through 20? This judgment was based on the teaching of Moses, which Jews had observed from antiquity, verse 21. Yet why should the Gentiles be troubled with these things, but not circumcision, when the original topic of debate was whether they should be compelled to keep the law of Moses, verse 5, at all? Note that the final instruction of the letter, which the elders and apostles wrote, is not fully consistent with the line of reasoning that we've recorded in this chapter. Um, I, I disagree so, so with that. We need to, we, that would be maybe, a maybe deeper discussion of yeah, Acts 15. Yeah, that's a deeper discussion of, of Acts 15, but I actually disagree with that conclusion that Doug's made that they were inconsistent. They were, they were, they were, they were perfectly consistent. They were operating by divine inspiration and revelation. And so I, I would argue that that that's not a correct conclusion that they were being inconsistent in their application. But, but they were again, applying. Like, they were applying other New Testament principles on how you behave so that you don't offend. Uh, the yeah, it was yeah exactly. It was a, it was a conscience matter that they were just they were uh, instructing the the Gentiles not to. They eat, obviously eat, uh, were not things. binding the law of Moses. They just got done saying that they shouldn't bind the law of Moses. Yeah, and and the abstain they commanded them to abstain from meats offered to idols, and he, and he says because the the uh, in every city verse twenty one in every city there are those that the uh, being the scriptures of of Moses are being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So therefore abstain from eating meats offered to idols. But later, Paul, when writing to the Corinthians, said it's okay to eat meat offered to idols. And so it was it was just a judgment to avoid offense by these new Gentile converts. But we that's that's really off off uh, that's, we, it's a rabbit we don't have time to chase. Yeah, we just right? can't chase that, but, right. uh, but I, I, I disagree with the conclusion they were being inconsistent. Thank you, Doug, uh, for your, your email tonight. Um, let's go to one more break. When we get back, we're going to go fast. Two more questions to About consider. About the holy kiss and foot washing. Holy kiss and foot washing. We'll do both of those on the other side. Don't go anywhere. We're back right after this. Now you can listen to a podcast of a recent sermon every week. Find out more at collegeview.com. There's more of the virtual Bible study right after these important messages. Hello. Hey, Matt. No, I don't have any plans for Friday night. What are you doing? Oh, I won't be able to go with you to watch that movie. Because, Matt, the movie is rated R. Hey, why don't you just come over and hang out at my house Friday night? Great, I'll see you there. Being pleasing to God means that you may have to be different than the crowd, but don't be afraid to stand up for what's right. It just might find that it's easier than what you expect. A message brought to you by College of Church of Christ. We're tracking the trends on the virtual Bible study. A recent survey found that scientists on the whole are much less religious than the general public. In fact, scientists are roughly half as likely as the general public to believe in God or a higher power. According to the poll, just over half of scientists, 51%, believe in some form of deity or higher power. Specifically, 33% of scientists say they believe in God, while 18% believe in a universal spirit or higher power. By contrast, 95% of Americans believe in some form of deity or higher power. Specifically, more than 8 in 10 Americans, 83%, say they believe in God and 12% believe in a universal spirit or higher power. Finally, the poll of scientists finds that 4 in 10 scientists, 41%, say they do not believe in God or a higher power, while the poll of the public finds that only 4% of Americans share this view. That information is via Pew Research. The Word of God says in Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Missed a recent virtual Bible study program? Listen to any of our past programs from the archive section of our website. Now, back to the virtual Bible study. All right, we're back on the program. Uh, got a, a comment from guest 6297 in the chat room. Says it was a swig and a miss on the building issue. You're ignoring biblical examples to add what you wish. You condemn others for logic like that. Well, we're, we tried to explain our uh, reasoning and our support for 
the practice of owning a building. I have a question for 6297, if you would, in the chat room, just respond quickly to this. Do you agree or disagree with a church owning a building? Do you think that churches shouldn't own buildings? Are you, are you arguing that churches should not own buildings? And if you are not arguing that, then by what reasoning and authority do you derive for a church owning a building? I think that would be helpful to us in this discussion. Either, either it's wrong and we shouldn't, or you do uh, agree with owning a building, then what would be your authority for owning a building? Okay, and then, and then a, a follow-up question. What about the, par- the, the parallel that we drew about going? Do you think it would be authorized to go to preach the gospel in an airplane? Uh, and, and if so... Uh, there's no example of that in the scriptures. How would you auth- how would you justify flying in an airplane to go to preach the gospel somewhere? Okay. All right. Uh, now on to the last real, two questions. Real quickly, the 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 question about uh, the Holy Kiss. We talked about this last week, so we can go pretty quick. How would you? I ask. How would you reply to this comment? Greet one another with a holy kiss. As is a direct command. Some man at some time decided this is not to be bound. And I asked specifically, does this show an inconsistency in our application of Bible authority? Uh, Kent answers that by saying, the principle relating to Bible authority has two essential components. One, things that are authorized so far as divine requirements, and two, things that are authorized that are optional. Does God require that we kiss fellow Christians? No. There is no divine principle that obligates Christians to kiss one another. However, we do have generic authority to greet one another, and there's divine requirement for all greetings, kissing, and all other types to be based upon biblical holiness. I think I agree with what Kent said there. And and I just want to repeat some comments we made last week. We know that the holy kiss was not the only form of greeting in the first century. In fact, even among Christians... We know that there were salutations or greetings made in different ways, by spoken word, by written word, by a gesture of the hands, Acts 21, verse 40, by a clasping of the hands. In Galatians 2, verse 9 specifically, Paul mentions that James, Peter, and John gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. So there's handshaking. So th- this, is, this is very much like what we were talking about, Jacob, concerning the type of meeting place that we use or that we provide there's no exclusive pattern there are multiple options therefore we can choose any of those Uh, if if the form of greeting in our culture was to rub noses we could rub noses whatever whatever in other words we're not bound by a specific kind of greeting We're, we're not required to use just one there's there's no exclusive pattern but if but but if we're going to meet, if we're going to greet with a kiss and in some cultures they they do that even today i've been to places in the world where it's very typical for men and men to greet men with a kiss men and women to greet one another with a kiss especially between men and women we believe that that if you're going to greet with a kiss it would still be a requirement of god that it be a holy kiss Obviously, there there would be uh, uh, an opportunity there or a temptation uh, to think lustfully or or, or 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 to engage in lascivious practice. So, in regards to the holy kiss, if you're going to agree with a kiss, as they still do in some places, make sure it's a holy kiss. But that's not an exclusive. That, that, that's that's the command is agree with a holy kiss. If you're going to kiss, make it a holy kiss. But it's not, it, it is not the exclusive pattern of greeting that existed in the first century. We're able to demonstrate that. And so it wasn't some man who came along and said, ah, we don't, have, we don't have to agree with the Holy Kiss. No, it was the Bible itself that says that various forms of greeting, even among the apostles, they, they shook hands. Various forms of greeting existed in the first century. There's nothing exclusive requires that the only kind of greeting that Christians can make one to another is a kiss. But if you're going to kiss, 
it is certainly a requirement that it be a holy kiss. So Paul was basically regulating an existing practice there, but he was not mandating an exclusive form of greeting. So we need to make it very clear that we're not saying, well, you can just throw that, exam- that command out because times are different. That, uh, that t- today is different. You don't, have to, you don't have to obey that command. We're not saying that. And that's what was implied by Mike from Nashville. He says, I think you guys demonstrated a willingness to interpret commands and to shape them in a way that seems right to you while not necessarily strictly obeying the command. Greet one another with a holy kiss is pretty straightforward, but you interpret it through a modern lens, your current situation, cultural norms, etc., and you determine that following the letter of the law is not necessary, rather adherence to the spirit of the law is best. No, we're not saying you don't have to follow the letter of the law. We're saying that this was not the exclusive Pl- instruction. Please take all of the information that's available. I mean, I mean that's, what, that's the logical process, uh, too, uh, is take all the bits of information and, and, and draw the, the necessary conclusion. Uh, even the command, Mike says, of thou shalt not kill is subject to interpretation. We agree that killing is wrong unless you're a World War II soldier drawing a beat on a Nazi, unless you're a gun-owning uh, owner defending uh, your home against a violent intruder, unless you're a judge sending seen a serial murderer to lethal injection, or the prison doctor administering the fatal drugs to be condemned, etc. Yeah, you know, the problem with that, Mike, the command although it is worded in the King James, for instance, thou shalt not kill, but the word there is murder. Thou shalt do no murder. Literally, the, the instruction is thou shalt do no murder. And we're because not in- one of the, even in the Old Testament, one of the, one of the Ten Commandments was thou shalt not kill, and then God sent the, the Israelites out to kill. And so uh, it, the, the instruction there properly uh, translated would be do no murder. So we're not interpreting through a modern lens our current no. situation or cultural norms. Uh, and, uh, and, and so when, when the judge sentences a serial murderer to lethal injection, he's not murdering that guy. Right. Uh, he, he's, actually, he's actually following biblical authority. Whether he knows it or not, he's actually following bi- biblical yeah. authority. Yeah, God has set the, the, the rulers in place for that, for that very purpose. purpose. And then real quickly, we're just out of time again, but real quickly, what about the... The foot washing. Is Jesus' example of washing the disciples' feet a binding example, or is it perhaps a case of us picking and choosing which examples we bind and don't bind? It's a binding example. It's, it is binding on us that we be ready to serve one another. That's right. That Jesus said we're to follow his example of providing needed service to one another. But he was not binding ceremonial foot washing. Because uh, the reason we know that, we're reading the scriptures. We're trying to understand them. There's no place in the Bible where saints came together to engage in ceremonial foot washing. Now, in that same meeting where Jesus washed the saints' feet, he instituted the Lord's Supper. We do see the early Christians coming together to observe the Lord's Supper. Right. But we never see them coming together to engage in ceremonial foot washing. So the, the binding example of Jesus is that of providing needed service to one another. We need to be doing that, and if it takes the form of foot washing, which it can and it does, then we need to so, be doing that. Yeah. Uh, someone needed their feet washed. They were, they were sick. They were infirm. I'm, what do you do? The, the guy asked me to wash his feet. I washed his feet. But, but, and I believe I was doing that as a required following of the example of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and you want, you might give someone a bath. You might do what Peter did. Might, you know, you may might might want to wash the whole your whole body. Whole, whole body. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could do that. It's a matter of serving, and that's what Jesus teaches us: that no one is above serving, and that we need to be serving our brother. Yeah. All right. I think it's a good a, a good discussion. We've had it for about three weeks now. We'll try to move on to something different next week, but we are open to the things that you want to talk about. And so if, if, if there's a need for more discussion on this or any other topic, just let us know. And again, back to our very initial comments tonight. We're not trying to be mean-spirited or harsh. Or win an argument. Or win an argument. We're trying to understand the Bible and make application of so it. So I hope you understood our tone tonight. We did not mean to come across in the wrong way. And we'd welcome your comments about our tone or about what we've said. Or if you've got further questions, you want further discussion, we'd welcome that. Kyle, we have not gotten to you all night tonight. Uh, any comments on that side of the board? 
Uh, it was just a lively discussion. I think it's it's great. I think it's good that uh, people are willing to defend what they believe, and that's you know it's a good back and forth. It's what we need. It's what we want on this program. So I think it's a good program tonight. All right. All right. Good discussion. Thanks, Thanks Kyle, for being here to help us, and Dad, thank you for your Thanks, good discussion. Jay. And uh, thank you for being there uh, on the other end of the line tonight. And uh, we hope you benefited from our study and discussion of God's Word. We hope to make plans to be back here this time next week for another edition of the Virtual Bible Study. In the meantime, we encourage you to put God first in your life, study His inspired Word, the Bible, and live by it every day. You'll never regret it. Thanks for listening to the Virtual Bible Study, brought to you by the College View Church of Christ. The College View Church of Christ meets at 1618 Hampshire Pike in Columbia, Tennessee. If you are in the Columbia, Tennessee area, we worship with the College View Church of Christ on Sunday mornings at 9.30 and on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. The College View Church of Christ also welcomes you to attend their Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. If you have any questions about something that was said on tonight's broadcast or would like more information about the College View Church of Christ, please call 931-381-4567. That number again, 931-381-4567. Or for more information on the Internet, visit collegeview.com. Be sure to tune into the virtual Bible study this time next Thursday for another informative study of God's Word.